the word regionalism in the title here uh, refers, strictly speaking in art historical terms, to that movement in American art in the 1930s and 40s uh, when artists depicted various regions of the country, among them the South, in a conservative, realistic style. And if you saw the Imprinting the South exhibition of um, the main collection that I and my co-curator, uh, co-collector got together, um, you're familiar with that work. Uh, we have two works in the beginning of the exhibition to exemplify it, Alfred Huddy's Charleston Spires and Buell Whitehead's Woodchoppers. I've added a third here of you, a, a Georgia scene, a landscape artist, just to give a little more of a context here to emphasize that most of those prints were in black and white. They were small and uh, in uh, that conservative realistic style that uh, centered the picture area around one view into space with usually a suggestion of a third dimension into space. Most were in the standard print media at the time of intaglio, that's to say etching and dry point, sometimes aqua tint, mezzotint, relief in wood and linoleum, lithography and stereography. Well, that's a kind of a tradition that was started, and I don't want to suggest that that ended because there are artists uh, who continue to depict local scenes in that realistic style. We have one on exhibit, Philip Sage's Napoleon House Bar. Philip Sage is an artist that lives outside of New Orleans and depicts that city and the surrounding area in both color and black and white etchings. And then I've added a, third, a second one here, um, a Georgia artist, unfortunately deceased, but who depicted rural areas of that state and the coastal area in that detailed realistic style. To the extent they almost look like color photographs, Keith Rasmussen. Well, the important point here is that this exhibit, the main body of it, goes beyond realism into more innovative styles associated with the modernism of the, that developed in the last century. Those were the kinds of works that I sought out, but you'll see here, I think, a range going just beyond realism all the way to abstraction. So the thesis of the exhibit, and Dennis and Marilyn said that I, I should have a thesis, is that realism, uh, regionalism continued after 1950, even into, uh, in those works that are in this more modernist, almost you might say avant-garde style. I think the artists that made me realize that this could be the case, that you could have regionalism with the avant-garde, uh, is Ralston Crawford and his lithographs of New Orleans. I can't remember where I saw them, but uh, they made an impact on me. And um, he is an artist that is associated with the Precisionist movement, kind of an important name in American art history. Here's an example of his early style uh, that might be labeled precisionism of sleek uh, architectural structures that are kind of abstracted. This is the first print he ever did. Well, he served as a visiting professor of art at LSU from 1949 to 50, and then in 1954, I learned he went to Paris and under a master printer, um, made lithographs from some of the trips that he took to New Orleans where he photographed its sites. And what he was interested in for the prints were these above ground architectural tombs that you see in New Orleans cemeteries. They're uh, very impressive, some of them, and often have these iron railings around them. I got through the internet, I searched him out and got in contact with his son. Um, and he told me that this print that I was interested in, to the left, New Orleans Tomb 6, um, and that we have in the show, 
uh, was derived from iron on tombs, and I, I didn't know what he meant until he sent me these photographs that his father took. And uh, you can see, I think, and we have another print, uh, number seven, that I wasn't successful in acquiring for the show is kind of a companion piece, but you see it's the same genre. You can see where the um, star forms here in the lithograph can be derived from the star forms that are decoration on these, uh, looks like cast iron railings. But you might say they've been liberated from their moorings. We don't see uh, any rails attached to them and uh, they're kind of floating in space on these rectangular form structures. So I think what you see here is a process of imaginative reconstruction where an artist starts out from a scene, uh, maybe a photograph, a drawing, or something, and the work evolves. It's, it's really the creative process. So um, I recommended that we change the subtitle of this show from Prince About the South to Prince Inspired by the South because I'm not sure exactly what this represents. It might re suggest something dramatic contrast like just life and death related to the tombs. It may just be an interesting design that um, he was interested in and that finally evolved. So vis visual images are ambiguous. If there's abstraction as there is here, they're even more ambiguous. So there can be a range of meanings as to what this finally um, suggests. I started out, I think, thinking of this exhibit iconographically uh, starting from the natural world, uh, as I did with my book of the South. And we, I think we have two realms here in the natural world of the South. We have the ocean, and I can't say that I, th I think the South can claim part of the ocean as its territory, but the experience of going to the beach, of going to the shore, seems to have been seminal for artists in a lot of the iconography that they derived that you see in the show, images of shells and other more elaborate scenes with the ocean. And then the plant world, a world of vegetation that we have exemplified here uh, by Scott Stevens' composition, uh, segmenting space derived from his photographs that he took of trees on the campus of the University of Montevallo, where he is a professor of art specializing in printmaking. So, and Corey McCollum is probably learned the most well-known female artist of the second half of the 20th century in Charleston. So you see you have two tendencies here, one toward abstraction as you see an ocean, and the other, I think, toward, I would describe it as a segmentation of space, of breaking up that unified picture area, image area of more traditional, realistic works. Well, I think some of the particularly interesting works in the show, in the exhibit, uh, show an intersection of the human world with the natural world in a creative way. And one that exemplifies that is a monoprint, monotype, I should say, by Lynn Writing, who's a Charleston artist, uh, teaches at the Art Institute of Charleston, and is originally from the British Isles from Wales. And her print, Overwhelmingly Tropical, which she said she did, uh, to express the awe that she felt at just the lushness of the vegetation growing in the area around Charleston in that southeastern coast. But what you have here is figurative imagery in combination with abstraction. So I think its, it's meaning is a little more directed than uh, some of the others. You have an image of a young woman in the background there in a contour style drawing suggesting uh, a young woman at kind of the peak of her existence, of her maturity. 
uh, as a young person at least. And then you have a palm, an image of the palmetto plant here, suggesting the southeastern coast, figurative image combined with abstraction in these sweeps of green paint. Um, on the monotype print, which is kind of the easiest print medium to understand because it's basically just paint or ink. In this case, it's oil on a hard plate, a matrix against which paper is pressed. And then combined, I thought I'd mention this one too, it doesn't have a human connection, but it sort of completes the natural, natural cycle that she suggests in Overwhelmingly Tropical in uh, the downward cycle toward decline, decay, death, and so forth with this figurative imagery, images of driftwood, dead wood here, and uh, abstraction in the background. Now, this is turned out in this slide to be blue, but I, I have it as, as gray as I remember it from the actual print. So you've got grays and browns that are suggesting that decline. So these two prints kind of epitomize for me um, a way an ideal of regionalist art in that through the local, reference to the local, there's a suggestion of more universal themes. Uh, the image of kudzu, of course, has become kind of a symbol of the South, uh, our most prominent invasive species, and it intersects with human culture with other artistic works in these two prints. One by Laquita Thompson is a part of her Southern Heroine series where she matches a woman figure in Southern literature with a Southern plant and a season here, the summer, and well, the character that she's chosen is Blanche Dubois in A, a Streetcar Named Desire. Might, th this might be a metaphor here, Blanche Dubois kind of like kudzu and coming in and taking over the space of another organism here, but in a collage composition that you see in her, also in her two other prints in the show. And Laquita, I should say, is kind of the epitome of the Southern artist to me because she's lived in various parts of the South, among them Auburn, where she got her uh, MA degree, and she has uh, many Southern themes throughout her print oeuvre. Tom Hammond taught printmaking for years at the University of Georgia, and he has here an appropriation, that's to say a borrowing of another artist figure, and if you recognize the title, uh, the artist's name here in the title, Magritte Kudzu, this is uh, the, oops, Belgian artist, surrealist artist, René Magritte, who has these kind of signature figures in many of his paintings of the man with the bowler hat. And face is often obscured, kind of mocking conventions in art that, you know, have to show the face. And so he has here in his uh, kudzu representation, kudzu growing up, it looks like it's dead and actually uh, covering the face. Well, if you didn't know, don't know anything about the biography of this artist, I think this work is, the show is probably very enigmatic because it brings together images from Far Eastern Oriental art, the sculpted heads that you see in Oriental art together with uh, images of trees in a swamp. And the artist, Don Cooper, who is an Atlanta artist, actually traveled in the Orient, in the Far East, uh, starting with his service in the Vietnam War. And he said that when he was canoeing through a swamp in southeastern Georgia, he saw uh, images in tree forms and reflections in water of these uh, sculptured heads from the Orient. So it's a kind of a very subjective view that brings together memories from a distant past with a more recent past in um, a kind of interesting amalgamation. And I think these head forms that you see here at the beginning are probably not what he saw on the trees, but are there just to get you into the composition, get you into the work 
uh, incite your interest, and then you get into it, and then you see in the shadows in the background, uh, you can count the number of head forms that you'll see. Well, and then we have our kind of signature print for the show, Audubon, in the, I was pronouncing it a Chafalaya, but it's a Louisiana artist in the show who came here for a workshop, told me that it's a Chafala, and I presume that everybody here who reads the newspaper knows where this is. It's a big swamp area in Louisiana that uh, has recently been flooded. But Warrington Colescott is not from Louisiana. His parents, though, were born and raised in New Orleans. And he grew up in California and became an eminent professor of art, specializing in printmaking at the University of Wisconsin. And during that time of his career, he developed kind of a signature style of uh, satirical prints of historic and contemporary events and trends. And in his retirement, he bought a second home in New Orleans and traveled around the state uh, with his wife and so developed this uh, sweet Louisiana, a suite of Louisiana prints, about 10 prints, among which uh, Audubon in the Atchafalaya is one of the most interesting, I think, because it is an appropriation of Audubon's snowy egret that you see here. Um, and uh, Scott just told me that we are in the process of acquiring one in the octavo edition, so we will have one here. But you can see what Warrington has done here in kind of mis reshaping the figure towards satirical purposes, elongating the neck, putting an odd curve in the wing form, the mane sweeping out, so the birds look downright funny. And then you have Audubon here in the upper reaches, uh, kind of ambiguous space. He's uh, painting with one hand while he looks at the birds with the other, not quite uh, in, in line with the history that we know of him putting the birds up on a grid to paint them. And then there's someone down here shooting the birds, and then you notice these female figures finally in the background with their hats of feathers. And there was a problem in the 19th century of uh, the snowy egret population being uh, decreased and declined because of hunters shooting them for the feathers for the haberdashery industry. And then we have over to the right these figures that are enjoying the culinary delights uh, that for which Cajun country is noted. Well, Michael Krauss was a professor of art specializing in printmaking, and you can you hear this over and over, and this is kind of a model or paradigm for many of the artists in the show. They uh, achieved an MFA degree specializing, a lot of them, in printmaking and teach printmaking at universities or have done so, and he did um, at Huntsville. And during that time, he became aware of the development in the surrounding area, much like we see here. And he made that a subject for many of his prints. And so what you see in his color lithographs, in which sometimes he used plates for not, uh, seven different colors that are registered there, is construction forms brought very close to the foreground of the image area so that um, we only see a small segment of landscape. Oops. Sorry, uh, as you see in the background here. Um, and then this one, titled Paradise Lost, Thomas Cole's Nightmare, is an allusion, not so much an appropriation, a borrowing, but an, just an allusion to the night, famous 19th century landscape painter Thomas Cole, who himself was concerned about the disappearing frontier in the first half of the 19th century. So we move into kind of the subject matter here, iconography of architecture. Well, we have two printmakers in the show that interestingly enough had a sim similar experience dealing with the coast that resulted in somewhat similar themes 
for some of their prints. And they are both uh, professors of art specializing in printmaking, Bradley Shanks at the University of South Florida in Tampa, and Joe Sanders at uh, Columbus State University now. And what they did was build second homes on the same island off the coast of Florida, Dog Island. And it gave rise, as I said, the ocean has uh, kind of a thematic resonance for many uh, prints in the show, gave rise to a similar theme of our vulnerability to the elements, to natural forces. For Bradley Shanks, this is um, his Island House series. You can Google him and see other prints in the series that he did. But the ones that are on exhibit here show the house form that he said he built with his own hands as a kind of thin, spindly structure. As uh, you can see, this one here has bending. I don't know if you see it too much in this print, but uh, in this image, but you'll see it in the show, uh, a bending foundation suggesting its instability. And then the one to the right here is almost just a thin skeleton, not offering much protection to the human figures inside. It's kind of a projection of his fears, I think, in constructing this house on an island where you would, near the coast, feel much more susceptible to uh, natural forces. And then Joe Sanders has two, and this resulted in nautical imagery in his works. You see the boats um, on water in Many Hands of Fate, uh, generalized, somewhat abstracted. And then in the top half of the image area, these images of hands suggesting higher forces, and then looking at a stream coming down from above, a visualization of that, whether it's a hurricane, tornado, or what. Uh, those, those images of boats are further abstracted in this print where you've got sort of a football shape and imagery of water abstracted and up here too in uh, an interesting central design around which you have a border area with ropes. And we'll see this kind of border construction, uh, border frame for uh, a central image in other prints. Uh, Boyd Saunders set up the printmaking program at the University of South Carolina, now retired, but like many artists, um, went to the coast for his vacations, for the beach, and uh, this resulted in a, a number of prints with this shed structure jutting out into the ocean, which would be a very realistic scene, and he has some prints that are just the shed in the ocean that su suggest realism. But you see what he's done in this one. He's uh, superimposed on the structure of the shed other images that you see here of a single eye, which doing a little research I learned could be the third eye that represents higher consciousness and Buddhism and Hinduism, or in the Trinity, it can suggest the Trinity. If it's in a triangle shape, something like you have here, you have an image of a bird suggesting the spirit, a uh, palmist hand uh, suggesting higher powers. So all kind of suggesting higher powers associated with the, the ocean and raising the image complex above realism. Lise Corrigan uh, has several prints in the show. She is a Charleston artist who runs a gallery in Charleston selling her own and other artists' work. And in this one, Tides of Time, she represents one of the landmarks of her native city, St. Michael's, uh, the spire of St. Michael's Church, uh, severely cropped on the edge, really, of the image area. And then the rest of the composition, um, uh, suggesting the sea, the, the sky, it's kind of ambiguous, abstracted here, maybe another planet. In other words, the larger 
world uh, or the, even the larger universe. And she also has an appropriated image here, you know, of the melted clock from Salvador Dali. So a suggestion here, again, notice the connection with the ocean um, of struggle maybe of human artifacts to survive in light of, of the larger universe. And the title Tides of Time suggests natural time uh, in contrast to the humankind of this melted clock that's been kind of thrown away here. So I think uh, what we might say is that at this point the exhibition turns toward the historic, toward the area of uh, the Southern heritage. Uh, we do have that represented in a number of prints and Conrad Ross's of Noble Hall, so certainly are our local <coughs> reference points. Uh, Noble Hall is our own antebellum mansion, antebellum home that's out on Shelton Mill Road, an 1854 uh, structure that is alive and well thanks to the renovation that was done in the early 1990s, and that's when uh, Conrad constructed, or not constructed the house, but constructed his prints that you see in both intaglio and um, relief. He's done it in, oops, oops, in sections here of um, intaglio, two in intaglio here, and a third section uh, added in 1993. And the whole thing kind of suggests with the dark background that you have and these shadows, kind of the mystery associated with a house that was associated with slavery. To me, at least, that's just my personal interpretation. And I should say that Conrad, too, taught printmaking for years at a university here at Auburn and also runs his own press, Y Cross Press, and has a number of prints of architecture of the local area in the show. Um, Warrington Colescott, again, represents the Civil War, uh, a segment of it that was New Orleans' occupation by Union troops in 1862 under uh, General Benjamin Butler who was known as the Beast. He came into conflict with uh, Confederate women who rebelled against the occupation. He's known for his woman order, and you see him in the center here uh, writing, it appears, when he said that any woman who insulted Union troops by word, gesture, or other means would be treated as a woman of the town and dealt with accordingly. And this is because a woman dumped the contents of a chamber pot on uh, the head of Captain David Farragut and another prominent Union officer in rebellion. And there were other things they did, like spitting on the troops and so forth. Well, all this stopped with that order. Um, but he was severely condemned, not only by the Confederates, but also by some people in the Union and even denounced in British Parliament. So what you see in the print, and there's a number of segments that have been kind of fused together here, cobbled together, might be a good word. Um, you see women in the upper left. Uh, dumping the contents of chamber pots on the Union officers below. Warrington maintains that there were skirmishes between the women and the troops, and uh, I haven't found any historic corroboration of that. You see that in the upper segment. And then what's emphasized, because it's in the foreground and larger, are these women mooning the troops here. Um, I don't think there's historic evidence for that, but it, it's... Uh, <laughs> A good example of, I think, Warrington's, I think the word is here, ribald uh, sensibility. He's often, you know, very earthy. But his grandfather was a, a child uh, in New Orleans during the Civil War and told him stories about it, he said, and he also read about it. Well, we have another image referring to the Civil War in uh, an interesting print 
for the combination of different viewpoints that are brought together here. Um, you have an interior view of a room, an empty room kind of haunting, an aerial view that the artist says is due to a World War I victory poster where you have uh, an airplane from that era and then an inside outside view of a shed and then kind of as a collage on that is saddle uh, equipment uh, uh, surrounding an image of Stonewall Jackson and I think that's what gets the emphasis here because this is in color in contrast to the other area in black and white. So it's kind of an en enigmatic print it's Southern because Stonewall Jackson, of course, is a revered general of the Confederacy. And um, I think, to me, it suggests the imposition of the past on the present. But it can also suggest, because of this World War I victory poster, uh, maybe the d ambiguity between a illusion and reality. Well, Travis Somerville uh, brings together, uh, and, and this is the print here that we have on view, one of two prints in his family reunion series, a very disparate uh, imagery that give the impression of incongruity. So you kind of gives you a jolt and you take notice. He is uh, an artist who is living in San Francisco, but grew up in the South and was the child of parents who were civil rights activists. And he experienced racism, the racism of the South at that time, and so it plays an important role in his work. Um, I'm not sure the ones, the uh, family reunion series that we have on view, this one particularly refers to racism in the South. I think it could apply to that of the whole country. What you have are scanned inkjet prints of vintage photographs of children, smiling, well-attired children, suggesting they're of the privileged class. And superimposed on that, there are some collet elements, Collet just means it's really glued by the press, like this banner brother, but drawn in lithography are these images that in bright color that are superimposed on the photographs and uh, seem incongruous, but kind of have a shock effect. And I think this one suggests almost a cartoon black figure that's a toy of the child, suggesting insensitivity to uh, black people and derived from these kinds of artifacts that you see labeled Black Americana on eBay that were prevalent uh, through much of our culture. And he, ha he sent, recently sent me a catalog of his work, so I think I, I understand a lot better. And he has a number of these things in his studio that he he uses in his art. Certainly, um, this one on view has many, in, to, to me, were incongruous elements. So you have an image of Malcolm X in a Klan headdress with the title Song of the South as a label on top. Uh, in the catalog he sent me, there were images of some paintings he did of Malcolm X that I brought in here to show the derivation of this print. And he says in the catalog that he considers, he was interested in showing in Malcolm X is paradox, the fact that uh, great leaders often have very human failings that um, they have to deal with. and so. Uh, this was the case with Malcolm X, who was a head of the Nation of Islam and considered whites, blue-eyed devils, I think, and evil. So he associates him, as you see to that, in that painting to the left particularly, with some of the racism that he associates in the South. And Song of the South refers to uh, the 1946 movie by Disney uh, that dramatizes Uncle Remus tales uh, and almost becomes ironic with the image of the angry uh, black man that you see in the main 
portion of the image area. Certainly a provocative print. I felt a little sheepish about including it in the show, but I thought, ooh, I really need to if it says Song of the South, if it relates to the South. But it, it, it is provocative and to suggest it have sort of a shock effect. Well, we have a number of Klan images in uh, the exhibit. Uh, William Christenberry has, uh, he did, I think, five for Rolling Stone Press in Atlanta, and we have two on view here of a clan, clan figures. One pointed male, is, I was going to say, is a conventional image of a clan figure, but it's slightly more pointed at the top and angular to, to give it sort of a threatening, ominous quality. And it's part of his clan tableau of a group of drawings and, uh, drawings and sculptures that he did of clan figures based upon his experience of coming face to face with a clan figure on the courthouse steps of the Tuscalo Tuscaloosa County Courthouse and really being common parlance, freaked out in the process, being terrified. And so he uses the Klan kind of as a symbol of evil. And I think maybe the abstraction surrounding the figure um, suggests the clandestine activities of Klan figures. The one by Carolyn Durieux, Deep South, is much more original and idiosyncratic in form. This was done in 1957, which would have been three years after the Brown versus Board of Education decision when you might say all hell broke loose in the South in resistance to um, this edict and, and civil rights. So the upper portion of the image, I think, uh, does suggest the Klan, but the lower portion kind of narrows down here, and you have these sharp angles cutting into the form with white hair, kind of suggest eyes and mouth area to me, and makes me think of some of her earlier pieces that she did. This is her, kind of her signature style in the early part of her career, uh, satirical lithographs, uh, focusing on the human head, uh, showing snobbish attitudes, uh, less than benevolent attitudes, you might say, of people. And so you might see uh, that this image, Deep South, refers a little more generally, uh, a little more beyond the Klan, just into in that narrow interpretation. I wanted to make sure uh, civil rights was emphasized enough in the show because after all, it's the most important series of events of the South of the period under consideration. I think that the South's whole lifestyle uh, to a great extent has been transformed by this movement. And Mary Walker's six woodcuts in her book um, certainly helped me represent the civil rights movement. And you've got three here that I think are very important. The one to the left representing uh, Jim Crow era when you had this segregation signage and separate facilities for blacks and whites. Then to the right, you've got the importance of the vote. And then in the center, what happened in the between to affect this transition? Well, blacks uh, were beaten and, and, and suffered physical violence often uh, at uh, the likes of the Klan. And so you have figures, a uh, figure covering his head, prostrate on the ground, and then other figures uh, here pummeling him with fists and feet. And then a Robert Indiana, a very well-known artist uh, associated with the pop art movement and using lettering in, in prints, uh, represents uh, outside criticism of the South. Uh, he's not an, a Southern artist. He's from Indiana. He said this was a, a nom de blush, a de brush, uh, a, a name of the, from the brush, and I think worked in New York. But uh, this was a targeting of a place in the South where the three civil rights workers 
on view in the exhibition in a print by Ben Shawn were murdered. And this is a reproduction from his series of paintings titled The Confederacy, where he targets different areas of the South. I think there are four of them, one being Selma, Alabama, for their resistance to civil rights workers. Well, we pass from southern heritage, uh, that collective heritage, to personal heritage in the South. And uh, for a number of black printmakers in the show, they traced their heritage to the South in prints. And uh, I think it's kind of comforting to know that for many of them, at least, uh, they had happy experiences. Uh, in the South due to the close family ties that they had. David Driscoll has uh, serigraph echoes that you see here to the left that is a representation of his father's church in North Carolina. And you see by, it's only a small portion of the picture area, but around it you have these bright colors with a lot of white mixed in, uh, suggesting to me lightness and joy and maybe also the spirited services that uh, were often carried out in black churches. And uh, Romari Bearden uh, was very happy to be able to get from the Mint Museum this print, uh, Pepper Jelly Lady, because in the surrounding border area, he traces some images from his past in North Carolina. He grew, well, lived for some years in Charlotte, North Carolina, then his family moved to New York, and, but he came back repeatedly to Charlotte to visit relatives, among them his grandparents, who you see in the upper left up here. And you have an image of tobacco leaves representing North Carolina, and then his self-portrait here. Although the identi exact identity of the pepper jelly lady I don't think is known, but he's certainly one of the most eminent, well-known of, of black artists. And then Charles Kreiner, in the center uh, is a resident artist at the Museum of, uh, Southern, uh, Museum of Printing History in Houston and derives much of his imagery, his scenes from memories of working with his grandmother in the fields picking crops in East Texas. And he has said that uh, he wants to depict these experiences because he's proud of them and he wants young black people who have this in their heritage to be proud of them as well. And you see with modernism how it's liberated the artist from strict anatomical correctness and he ha in depicting this figure because he really emphasizes the broad back of this woman who's a woman he and his grandmother knew, a uh, small head here and then the kind of twist of the arm here to show the grasp of these uh, P forms. And then we have a large segment in the exhibit relating to native music of the South. I don't know if you'd say indigenous music, but it's, it's certainly southern music. First of all, the blues in uh, an intaglio print by Radcliffe Bailey, an Atlanta artist where he also refers to his heritage as that photogravure in the center of a tobacco field is one of his grandfather's tobacco farm in Virginia and surrounding it are intertwining leaves of the tobacco vines and superimposed on a blue background suggesting blues music is kind of soothing to the arduous work that would have been involved in uh, tilling tobacco. George Davidson works in Athens now, but when he went to college in Memphis, Tennessee at uh, Southwestern, now Rose College, he fell in love with the blues music of Beale Street, and he's made that the subject of his lino cuts ever since. Notice the inside, outside view that they have here, and how this figure kind of pulls you into the composition. A contrast with Richard Zollner, uh, whose figure seems kind of uh, anonymous here of the guitar player. Uh, Richard Zollner was hired to 
uh, teach at the University of Alabama, built up the art department there, and taught printmaking there for years. But he told me in an interview that he learned to love blues music by going to the bars in the surrounding area of Tuscaloosa. And so the guitar player uh, was uh, an image that he did several times at least, I know, of, in his print oeuvre. And finally, we have, we might say, white music, too, represented in Image of a Country Singer by Roger Brown, who was from Opelika and moved to Chicago. We had a major retrospective exhibition of his work here, kind of uh, what looks like a commercially packaged image of Alabama's sure, country music musician, Hank Williams, and then an uh, image of an accordion player here in uh, Francis Pavey's unique woodcut, which his woodcuts, they're, not, they're really, you should say, they're relief prints because some are from wood blocks and some are from lino cut blocks, but they're individual elements, individual block elements that he uses from one print composition to another. So each one is unique. But here the accordion player suggests the zydeco music of his native Louisiana. And then he has other imagery like that of water and uh, swamp grass that uh, he says refers to his native Louisiana. So we come to the end and um, to another abstract print by Carolyn Durieux that is in a new medium. And I haven't said much here about some of the new media that printmakers use during this era. I'm honestly not that well versed in it, but I can tell you what I've read and Carolyn Durieux as a professor of art at LSU, uh, developed with a botany professor this electron print that uses radioactive isotopes in the ink, bringing it together with photographically sensitive paper. Um, and the print, you can get an addition as long as that, those radioactive isotopes are uh, active. So um, thank you all for listening and um, I hope you've seen the exhibit and enjoyed it.